Hello, I'm Dr. Art Friedman. Welcome to the 11th Annual Chidon Hamada Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Science Contest, brought to you by Dr. Yosef Walter, President and CEO of Integrated DNA Technologies and the Walter Science Center. This year's topic, appropriately enough, is agricultural science, as this happens to be a Shemitah year. The book that we're using, which many of you probably already know, is The Science of Agriculture. Uh, it's by um, Ray Hearn, and um, this is, I think, contains something like 29 chapters. If you look at the book, you'll see that um, there's a lot of white space in it. There's big margins, and the print is fairly large, and the book is not very, very uh, deep. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not an extremely advanced book. It's probably a high school uh, level book. We usually use college level books when we do this. But it turns out that uh, in college, if you're going to study agricultural science, you're actually not going to have a single textbook. You're going to have a whole bunch of textbooks. Uh, probably every chapter that's in here is going to have its own, or every subject area is going to have its own textbook. And rather than encumber you with thousands of dollars worth of textbooks, we thought this would be an appropriate uh, compromise. And to make it a little bit more challenging, I'm giving you these lectures as well, and you'll be responsible for the content of the lectures. So the way the contest works, for those of you that are new, is that um, there's going to be, you've already taken the entrance exam, and that's the first three chapters of this book. And I believe the last four or maybe five chapters of the book are not actually uh, going to be covered at all. But there's going to be approximately two chapters uh, a week that you will be responsible for. And uh, one of those two chapters, I will take some subject in that, and actually that will comprise my lecture for the week. Each of the exams, that I, the part of the exam that I give you, will consist of 25 questions. Probably uh, 19 of those questions, 19 to 20 of those questions, will come directly from the book. Uh, the other five or six questions, about a quarter of the exam, will come uh, from, from the lectures themselves. And in addition to that, then Rabbi Weiner will be giving you some uh, ju uh, of the Judaic aspects uh, of, uh, of agricultural science. He'll be lecturing you on that, and his, he will be also writing a, a, a shorter number of uh, questions that will be appended to these exams as well. So uh, I wish you good luck on the exams, and I'd like to begin by, uh, with the first lecture, which is going to be on uh, chapters. It comes from chapters four and five specifically from chapter five. Uh, it sells agricultural building blocks and chapter five is uh, genetics. And in genetics, I want to talk to you uh, specifically about uh, genetically uh, modified organisms, which will actually form the uh, content, as I said, of the first, uh, first lecture. So genetically modified organisms, what are they? How, how do we make them? And there's a lot of controversy about them. Uh, what's all the fuss about? So that's what we're going to be discussing. So first of all, let's look at the kinds of uh, genetically modified organisms that are out there. There are three uh, broad categories, cisgenic, subgenic, and transgenic. Cisgenic organisms are organisms that, even without man's help, we'd be getting cisgenic organisms all the time. When a bee pollinates, uh, goes to a flower, it, it gets pollen, and it transfers that pollen to another flower, maybe a flower uh, of a closely related plant, maybe not, could even be the same plant, but maybe uh, that plant had a, uh, had some, because of, of natural genetic uh, distribution, that plant maybe was a little shorter or a little, had a slightly different color than the other plant. So when that, when that kind of a crossing takes place, whether it's done by the bee or whether it's done by uh, human beings who've actually transferred the pollen from point A to point B, uh, we call that kind of modification a cisgenic modification. Now, uh, so that, that is a, uh, what we would call a low-tech kind of a genetically modified organism. And it's a genetically modified organism that nobody seems to have any problem with. Now the next category is what is known as subgenic. And a subgenic uh, organism is one where uh, one, or maybe even more, more than one gene have actually been deleted from the organism or silenced. So you can use what are known as short interfering or small interfering uh, RNA molecules, that's the ribonucleic acid, 
and uh, these things will actually suppress a gene. So it's possible to get genetic suppression uh, on uh, a certain level on a particular gene, and uh, once that gene is suppressed, then we have some, what's called a subgenic uh, modification. And um, that requires a little bit more, uh, obviously a little bit more biological sophistication. That's not something that would normally happen. A gene would not normally uh, 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 be silenced by uh, natural processes. Uh, transgenic modifications are the ones that I really want to concentrate on primarily because those are the ones that seem to be causing people uh, the most problems, at least the people that have problems with uh, GMOs. And what a transgenic modification is, is a modification in which, in which a gene from one organism is inserted into an entirely different organism. So this isn't the question of two closely related organisms where, you put, where you're putting in um, one, one kind of gene and then another uh, in, in, from one organism into a, something that, that's a, a cousin of that organism. This is taking, it could be even be something from an animal and putting that animal gene into a plant. So that is called transgenic uh, modification. So we're gonna look at uh, here the DNA mo molecule so we can understand a little bit about what it means to modify a gene. So all of the genetic information is contained in, a in the molecules of DNA that are present uh, within an organism. In human beings, for instance, we have uh, very long chains of DNA in every cell in our body, except for erythrocytes, red blood cells, which don't have a nucleus. All the other cells in our body uh, contain DNA. And we have uh, three billion base pairs. Uh, the base pairs are these, um, these nucleotides, uh, adenosine. Well, actually here we're just showing the, uh, the actual nitrogenous bases, not the entire uh, nucleotide, but uh, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And you'll notice that they, they pair up in a specific uh, order, that the adenine always pairs with the thymine, adenine, thymine, thymine, adenine. The guanosine always pairs with the, uh, the uh, guanine always pairs uh, with the cytosine. So guanine, cytosine, uh, thymine, adenine, etc., And you have this combination along these very, very long chains of DNA. They're actually held together by something called hydrogen bonds. We'll see that on, uh, on the next slide. And here you can see, again, this is the, showing you the actual structure of thymine, of uh, guanine, of cytosine, and of adenine. So you'll notice that both adenine and guanine have two rings. Uh, this is a called a bi, uh, bicyclic uh, nitrogen heterocycle. So you've got two rings here, and the there are four nitrogens uh, in those two rings. There's a six-membered ring, six carbon at six, uh, four carbon atoms and two nitrogens, and then a five-membered ring. That's three carbon atoms and two nitrogens over here. So you have that. Uh, these things that have the two rings are, uh, as a class, are refer referred to as purines, and the ones with the single ring are called pyrimidines. So these are the pyrimidines here. You don't really need to know this for the exam, but I'm just pointing out to you, uh, what I would like you to know is, the, is, is to recognize is that adenine does pair with thymine, and uh, guanine pairs with cytosine. And you really only have room for these three rings across here. So you can't have a guanine, you couldn't even, if you had a guanine on one side, and then you had a, an adenine on the other side, that would cause a bulge here, and that, would, that really would not, those things would not be very, very stable. Uh, what's holding them together are hydrogen bonds. These are bonds between uh, hydrogens from uh, amino groups and oxygens or uh, hydrogens uh, from uh, amines here to, uh, uh, to nitrogens. Uh, these bonds are not as strong as the bonds that hold together, for instance, these two, this, these two carbon atoms, or this carbon and nitrogen atom, these are much stronger bonds. These bonds only have about 5% of the strength of the um, covalent bonds, which are caused by the sharing of pairs of electrons. And these bonds are much, much weaker, only about maybe roughly 5% of the strength. And that's gonna be important for the way that DNA actually is uh, duplicated naturally and in the laboratory. And I want you to also notice that uh, in addition to that, there's another part of the molecule, and this doesn't change uh, for all of the, um, the, the DNA. There is a sugar, uh, it's a, um, a five carbon sugar, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, 
and there's an oxygen in this ring here. It's a five-membered ring. And this, is, uh, this sugar is called, uh, if there was a hydroxy group here, it would be called ribose. This is called two prime deoxyribose uh, because, there, because the deoxy means that there's no hy hydroxy group here. There's just hydrogen. And uh, removal of that makes uh, two, uh, two prime deoxyribose. And then uh, we put onto this hydroxy group here a phosphate group. This thing then becomes a nucleotide. This part right here, again, we've got adenine. This, uh, if we just had this part from here to here, and an OH group, that would be called adenosine. And adenosine is a nucleoside. And then if we put the phosphate group on the end of it, then we get adenylic acid, or adenosine monophosphate, AMP, and that actually is a nucleotide. So these are nucleotides. Uh, we actually add them in uh, as a, a adenosine triphosphate. We use ATP, and two of the phosphate groups actually get cleaved off. Uh, so anyway, the phosphate deoxyribose backbone is actually put together by these what are called phosphodiester linkages. That's shown right over here. And um, you've got two ends. You've got the free end that has the free OH group from the ribose, and the other end, which has a terminal phosphate group attached to the uh, CH2OH up here of the ribose. And this end is called the five prime end. This is called the three prime end, and that's also important. So we're gonna go on and look at the next slide here, and we're gonna see how um, uh, you can, when we're actually, if we wanna make a genetically modified uh, organism, the way that that is actually done, uh, and these, uh, Organisms are actually um, come from bacteria. These enzymes come from bacteria. So what it says up here, the type of uh, cleavage, it's referring to whether or not we get an overhang here, which is called a sticky end, or we just cleave, we just break this, cleave it right, right along here, and then we get a blunt end. So uh, RE stands for restriction endonuclease. That is the uh, naturally occurring enzymes that actually uh, read along these chains of DNA, and when they come to a sequence that has GGCC for this particular enzyme, if it sees if it sees in one chain a GGCC, which means that the other chain will be CCGG going in this direction or GGCC going in that direction, it's going to actually cleave. Going one part will go along here, the other part will go along here. It's going to cleave between the G and the C, and it will give us two uh, blunt ends. That's going to look like that, and another blunt end that will look like that. So uh, the organism uh, that actually uh, this enzyme comes from is something called Haemophilus aegyptii, and it's actually a uh, bacterium. Uh, here's another Haemophilus organism, Haemophilus inf influenzae, and in Haemophilus influenzae produces a restriction endonuclease known as HIN-D3. And HIN-D3, what it does, uh, instead of there being four base pairs here, now you'll notice that there were six in this one. And for all of these other, for all of these, uh, all, all uh, four examples that I've given you here, uh, these things, um, if you look at them, you'll notice that they're palindromic. That means that if you look at one chain, where it's GGCC, the other chain, if we read it in the opposite direction, uh, it's going to still have this, it'll still be the same, GGCC. So here we have AAGCTT and the palindrome AAGCTT. So uh, what this one does is it reads along the uh, double DNA, double stranded DNA, and uh, it, when it encounters this combination, AAGCTT, it will cleave between the two uh, adenines. So you'll get what looks like this, which is a double, this part here will still be double stranded. It'll be double stranded right up to here, and then there will be one little overhang, this little piece right here, which is actually, I don't know if you can see this, uh, but what I'm referring to is right here. This little piece is actually going to be sticking out here, and that forms what's called a, stick, a sticky end. And then if we took another organism and we formed its sticky end using the same enzyme, uh, we could actually then take these two uh, pieces and uh, put them together, and that would give us a genetically modified organism. So we can do it for uh, with HIN-D3. Uh, we can do it uh, with BAMH1. Uh, BAMH1 is, uh, that comes from uh, Bacillus 
amylolipofacians, uh, another bacterium, and that looks for the, it cleaves again, uh, this one cleaves between uh, a double G, but it doesn't cleave all double Gs, it only cleaves where you have a double G followed by an ATCC. And here's the palindromic sequence as well. So you get, again, a sticky end. And the one that's used probably more frequently than any of the other ones is something that uh, actually uh, uh, is called ECO-R1, which comes from E. coli, and uh, that's Escherichia coli. And ECO-R1 uh, looks for the sequence GAATTC, and it cleaves between the, uh, the guanine and the adenine. And so again, you get this uh, sticky end shown down here. So you can take those sticky ends and then uh, use that to make uh, new uh, genetic combinations. Um, once you've done that, you've got a, a new gene or, or, or a, new, a new piece of DNA, and you want to actually be able to either purify it or look at it. Uh, you know, you only have, uh, if you're doing it on a very, very small scale, you really don't have enough DNA to do anything with, so you'd like to be able to make a lot of copies of it. And we can use a process called the polymerase chain reaction, uh, which I'm showing you in this slide right here. So here's our, uh, what we call region of interest here. You notice that there's the two directions, the five prime direction and the three prime direction. Copying starts at five prime and proceeds to the three prime. So it goes this way. So uh, it's gonna go along here and along here. Uh, this, uh, this uh, and that means that when you're copying it, uh, you're gonna be making the five prime is gonna be adding a new three prime whatever the, the base pair that's complementary to whatever happens to be here, that will be at the three prime end of the, uh, of the, new, uh, the newly made um, DNA strand. So first we heat it up to 98 degrees. This causes what is known as denaturation, which is actually a separation. It breaks those hydrogen bonds between uh, these two um, uh, chains here, two DNA chains. It breaks them apart um, and we'll hold it there for about one minute we put, put this into a device, which is shown up here, called a thermo, thermal cycler, and uh, that will hold that uh, at that temperature for approximately a minute. Uh, then the temperature is going to be dropped down. Uh, it says here 48 to 72 degrees. I think we usually run it about uh, 57 degrees. And uh, we've added other materials in here. We add um, strands of, uh, of RNA, which are called uh, primers. And these are... Um, oligonucleotides, they're, they're, uh, not, they're, they're, they're combinations of nucleotides, but they're only maybe 20, 25 base pairs in length, and they will pair with, they will, they're specifically designed, this is a matter of fact what IDT does, they make, make these things in the lab, and so they're specifically designed to uh, actually uh, latch on to whatever uh, we need on our five prime end here, we can actually latch on, we can read whatever the uh, sequence of nucleotides uh, happen to be, and then we have to design a, a primer that will actually bind at that particular site. And we call this annealing. Set at about 57 degrees for another minute or two, and uh, then uh, that allows the primers to bind. We also have something in there that's called a uh, polymerase. In this case, we use something called TAC uh, polymerase, which is a, uh, a polymerase that was isolated from a, an organism called Thermus aquaticus which is something that lives in hot springs. Because most of these uh, polymerases, uh, being enzymes, would be denatured. Uh, they, would actually, um, they, they would actually lose their, their activity at the very, very high temperatures that are used here. But uh, uh, Thermus aquaticus actually lives in things like hot springs. Like this is something you'd find like in a, in a, in a geyser, for instance. So it can, sur it can survive very, very high uh, temperatures. And uh, it turns out that uh, when you put that in there, along with the individual nucleotides, that's the A's, C's, uh, G's, uh, uh, G's, and T's that you need uh, to actually make DNA, you put them in there, they each one binds with its complement, and uh, then the polymerase sort of rides along here, and it attaches all those, uh, it, it forms those, it reforms those phosphodiester linkages that actually cause the molecule to become intact once again. So we started out with one double-stranded, we had two single strands, uh, two single strands, and we ultimately wind up with four, uh, four strands, uh, well, two uh, double strands, or if you want to look at it, look at this as individual strands, 
four strands of DNA. So in the at the end of the first cycle, looking at it as uh, single strands, we'd have four, uh, uh, four, four single-stranded DNAs or two uh, double-stranded DNAs. In the second cycle, we'd have eight, 16, 32. This is called a uh, uh, exponential amplification or uh, uh, it's a geometric uh, progression. After the 30th cycle, uh, we actually have uh, 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 approximately two billion copies that we've made. And um, if we go one more cycle, 31 cycles, that means we've got uh, two billion double-stranded uh, DNA, uh, or rather one billion double-stranded, uh, two billion single-stranded uh, DNA molecules. So we can take a, a, just a trace of, of DNA and we can make a lot of copies of it in a, a relatively short period of time. To, to do 30 or 31 of these uh, uh, amplifications uh, actually only requires a couple of hours. So you can make a billion, uh, a couple billion copies in a relatively short period of time. All right, uh, this is just showing you the process, real fast uh, 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 review of this. Here's your original DNA, you put in your primers, your TAC polymerase, your nucleotides. Uh, you, you go through the process, uh, you split, split, the, uh, split this into individual str uh, uh, strands on, on heat denaturing up here. You anneal the primers, uh, the primers are extended uh, and you're adding the uh, nucleotides across here and that's forming your uh, double-stranded DNA which you then heat denature and this goes round and round and round and that uh, is the PCR process. And here's actually how the PCR is actually, uh, once, you've, once you've done this and you want to see what the results are, uh, you can put a little stain into, your, uh, into a small amount of the DNA uh, fragments that you've made and you can put that into what's called either a polyacrylamide or agarose gel, and then we do gel electrophoresis. And here you can see uh, this uh, micro pipette uh, inserting some of this liquid material into these uh, wells that are here. And I'll show you on the next slide, you can see the actual, here you can see a technician actually doing that. Here are the wells, and uh, there are two or three, I think two of the wells have already been filled, and putting material into the third well. And this is sitting, in a chamber, this is the electrophoresis chamber, this device here, and uh, this is actually sitting under a uh, electrically conductive uh, buffer solution. And in the next slide, you can see the apparatus. Here it is again. So here you've got the whole apparatus together. There's actually two gels in here, one here and one here. And you can see over here these little uh, blue spots here. That's the, uh, the wells with the uh, DNA material that's actually put into here. And this is the power supply. It's being run at 150 volts. And this is this material here is the, is the staining material. And uh, DNA has a, um, because it contains all of these free phosphate groups, there's a negative charge because of the phosphate groups. And that means because this is the uh, cathode here and this is the anode, this is the positive elect electrode, everything is gonna move from the negative end to the positive end. So the direction of, of movement of these molecules is going to be this way. And since they've been stained, well actually we won't see it, we probably won't see, we'll have to stain again and then de-stain in order to see this. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna move everything, it will be really invisible. Uh, all of these uh, various pieces of DNA that are in here are gonna move up in this direction. And they're gonna move according to uh, how long the nucleotides happen. So the longer the nucleotide, the slower it's going to move. Uh, uh, not nucleotide, I should say polynucleotides. The longer the polynucleotide, the slower it will move. So if we have more base pairs, it's going to tend to lag behind one that has fewer base pairs, and that'll move faster. And then we will get discrete bands that we can actually look at, and uh, that we're going to see that on the uh, next slide here. So here you have the uh, origin up here. This is where we uh, actually have the um, where, where we act, these are the wells where we actually put in the DNA, and everything's moving downward. It's moving in this direction, and you can see uh, these are uh, six different uh, samples here, but each one has a different pattern of DNA. So you can see that uh, things that run that would run at exactly the same level would, would probably most likely be the same uh, oligonucleotide, but all of these things are different here. So you can actually see that uh, perhaps this one and this one might be the same but all the other ones seem to have different, uh, uh, they run at different rates. So now we're going to look at how do we actually, once we've actually 
made, we've now made our, our gene and we've amplified our gene. How do we get the gene into the plant? That's the next question. So uh, genetic engineering, how do, we, how do we do this in plants? Well, there are three principal ways. One of them uses what's known as a viral uh, vector. A viral vector is, um, oh, well, obviously, and that implies that it's a uh, virus. So there's, there's something called a bacteriophage, and here you see uh, the lambda phage. Uh, phage lambda is, a, uh, bacteria, is a, uh, a virus that actually infects E. coli. And uh, that particular uh, phage is frequently, uh, the uh, genetic material that's in it can be cleaved using a restriction endonuclease, and then it can be modified. And then when it, it infects uh, the E. coli, uh, we can actually take the uh, plasmids out of the E. coli and then insert them into a plant where this, we, we could use other phages that would directly uh, infect the plant since there are uh, a number of bacteriophages that will actually uh, infect the plant itself. Uh, another thing is called a cosmid. A cosmid is, if you look at bacteria, they have, uh, generally bacteria have a, a very, very long single strand uh, of DNA in them. And then they will have smaller little circular uh, pieces of DNA that are called plasmids. And the plasmids uh, can actually be cleaved using a restriction endonuclease. You can put in something like ECO-R1 and get sticky ends on either end of the, of the plasmid. So now instead of it being a circle, uh, it's now uh, two, uh, two it's, got, it's got now got two free ends. And then we can take something else that we've actually cut out of another organism and put that together and then reinsert that plasmid uh, Either back into the original organism, or we could take that we could take that plasmid and actually, while it's still got a sticky end on it, we could actually uh, uh, take that plasmid and fuse it to uh, the uh, DNA of a virus. And once we do that, the combination of the virus and the plasmid is called a cosmid, and we can use the cosmid again to uh, transmit the genetic material. There's a, another bacterium that's called Agrobacter tumefaciens. And this uh, results in something called mediated recombination. This particular organism uh, actually causes a disease called crown gall disease in a lot of different plants. And it can kill the plant, uh, certainly weaken the plant. It's a kind of tumor that forms on the, um, on the, st on the, on the stem of the, uh, of, of the plant. And um, the bacteria actually um, insert genes into the plant so the plant makes this gall. So what you can do is you can actually genetically modify the A. tumefaciens, and once you've done that, you can allow it to infect the plant. Uh, you can actually remove the things that are going to be harmful to the plant, and you can actually introduce some uh, beneficial uh, genes into the plant in that way. So that's a, a second method that is uh, commonly used. And the one that I find most interesting and when I originally learned of this method, I couldn't even believe that it existed, is the biolistic approach. This is bioballistic particle delivery. And the way this works is really uh, very incredible. It involves taking very small particles of uh, certain metals, like tungsten is sometimes used, gold is sometimes used, and to actually coat these little spheres, these microspheres of gold or tungsten with the genetically modified uh, uh, DNA that you that you prepared by these other methods. So now, once you've got this uh, on the spheres, the spheres are then put into a, a small plastic shell, kind of a bullet. And when this was originally done, what they actually did was they used a modified 22 rifle, and they fired this uh, this rifle. They fired this bullet. Now, if you're just going to fire a bullet at a plant, all you're going to do is just tear it apart. So what they do is they take um, some uh, uh, material from the plant, which is called a callus. It's basically undifferentiated cells. It's almost like uh, stem cells. Uh, you have stem cells in an animal. You can have stem. You can have the, the equivalent kind of thing, like a stem cell in a plant. And this callus tissue is placed on a petri dish. And above the callus is placed a uh, a block of a, with a certain thickness of uh, polycarbonate uh, 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 plastic, lexan. And uh, then the, uh, the shell, the DNA containing uh, shell, is actually fired at the lexan target. 
Now what happens is it penetrates the target. It doesn't go all the way through. It penetrates, and maybe just the tip of it actually uh, hits, uh, or some of that material is ejected off of the tip, and it actually hits the callus, some of the, uh, uh, of the uh, gold uh, uh, particles that are in there. It hits the callus. Well, the cells that it immediately hits, uh, those cells are going to be completely demolished. But this is a little bit like buckshot you know, that you get from a shot, shotgun shell. So it spreads out. And the stuff that's kind of out in the uh, periphery here, uh, those cells are not going to be killed, but some of that uh, uh, DNA is actually going to get shot into the cells. And believe it or not, this process actually works. And it's another way of uh, introducing uh, uh, material, genetic material, into a plant and modifying it. So let's look at, um, in this slide, the uh, amount of genetic modification that's actually occurred in the United States starting from about 1996, which is kind of just about at the beginning when we started to see GMO crops, uh, up to uh, 2013, last year. And in fact, um, you'll notice that uh, I've got three crops here that I'm, that I'm talking about, soybeans, uh, cotton, and corn. So the amount of acreage, uh, the total acreage, actually for these, for these crops, I don't have the, the 2013 uh, acreage, but I can tell you that, um, I think this is 2011, that there were 84 million acres of corn that were planted uh, in 2011. So it could be 90 million or something like that in 2013. Soy was 74 million acres. That pr probably has increased as well. And cotton, which was, uh, was nine and a half uh, million acres. Uh, so it might have been a little bit lower in 1996. But the percentage of acreage uh, that was actually uh, genetically modified, uh, where it says HD here, that stands for her herbicide tolerant. So these were specific, this was a specific gene or set of genes that were put into these plants to make them resistant to uh, herbicides, and particularly something like Roundup, uh, glyphosate, which is a, a herbicide that was, uh, I think I mentioned before, was developed by uh, Monsanto. And uh, Monsanto uh, uh, puts a lot of this stuff down. I use it myself uh, to control weeds that are coming up uh, between the cracks uh, in my cement. So whenever a weed comes up, I spray it with a little uh, Roundup uh, glyphosate, and uh, within a couple of days, that, that, that weed is dead. Well, if you're going to use, uh, use that for, uh, for weed control uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a field of, of corn, if the corn is not uh, modified, the corn's going to die as well. So that would be totally useless. So by inserting these, these genes in there, you can protect soy, you can protect cotton, and you can protect corn. And in uh, 1996, 7% uh, of all the acreage uh, was genetically modified to do that, and about 93% of the acreage uh, last year. And for cotton, the number was smaller in 96. It was only about 2% of the acreage, and now it's about 82, 83% uh, 2013. And for corn, uh, there was about three percentage of the acreage in 96, and uh, currently probably somewhere around 85% of the acreage is modified to be uh, herbicide tolerant. Uh, there's another kind of uh, gene that was put in. Uh, BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. Bacillus thuringiensis is a bacterium uh, that, has a, uh, that, that produces a toxin. It's not toxic to people, but it's highly toxic uh, to the larval forms of uh, certain uh, lepidopterous insects. These are things like butterflies and moths. And in the larval state, uh, these uh, uh, things are tremendous agricultural pests. They destroy acres and acres, uh, probably millions of acres of cotton, or they would destroy millions of acres of cotton and corn. So by putting in the BT uh, gene, the uh, Bacillus thuringiensis uh, gene, into these uh, uh, different um, plants, cotton, uh, the cotton and the corn, you can see that uh, in 1996, about 15 percentage of the acreage uh, was uh, BT cotton, and it was all the way up to 75 percent in 2013. And corn was only 1 percent uh, BT uh, uh, inserted in 96, and uh, uh, last year it was about 77 percent of the acreage. So this actually uh, causes problems for people who don't like genetic modification. And uh, that 
that's where the controversy comes in. So I wanted to, in my last slide, I just want to talk a little bit about the pros and cons of genetic modification, genetically modified uh, organisms. So one of the uh, uh, pros is uh, that you get improved shelf life. Uh, there was a new apple, a new genetically modified apple, which is called the nine browning arctic apple. And I'm not sure whether this is actually on the market. I think it is marketed in some areas of the, of the country. I'm not sure that it's uh, a pretty, I'm almost certain it's been approved, but I'm not sure just how much of this is actually being sold right now. But that, um, you know, if you've got an apple that stays out for a long period of time, it gets brown and mushy. So this gives it a greater shelf life. Also, if you cut into it, it, it doesn't start to, uh, to, to uh, brown right away. Uh, improved nutrition. Uh, rice, there's been, uh, rice has now been genetically modified uh, to have uh, uh, high levels of the precursor for uh, vitamin A. So by genetically modifying uh, the rice, um, we can now um, add to the diet of people it's not so important, I think, in the United States where people probably get uh, sufficient uh, vitamin A and they don't have to really uh, worry about this. But by putting in beta carotene, which is what gives it that golden color, uh, it's going to form vitamin A. And uh, this would be in countries uh, where rice happens to be a staple. And the people, uh, many of the people suffer from a vitamin A deficiency. Uh, another thing you can do is you can put in something that will confer resistance uh, to environmental stress. So for instance, um, plants that are uh, grown in environments where they might uh, experience drought, an extended drought, uh, plants that are grown in soils that might have a very, very, at some point in time might have a very high level of salt, uh, you can actually put in uh, specific genes that will confer resistance to those uh, environmental stresses. Herbicide resistance, I already mentioned. I talked about uh, glyphosate resistance. There's another herbicide called bromoxanil. Uh, they've also inserted genes that will protect against bromoxanil. But basically, uh, you can pretty much find something out there. Uh, if you've got a specific herbicide, you could probably find something out there that would, uh, some uh, gene that would be resistant to it that you could put in uh, to a specific plant. Another one is pathogen resistance. So uh, where you've got things like um, uh, plant pathogens, or many, many plant pathogens, uh, things that will actually, uh, uh, they could be bacteria, they could be other, uh, other forms uh, of, uh, of uh, path other pathogenic uh, types of organisms. Uh, fungi, for instance, you can uh, confer resistance, again, by genetic modification. Biofuel uh, production, things like uh, bioethanol, etc. Bioplastic production, that's a relatively new one. Uh, you can actually make plastic materials and this can be uh, helped out a lot by genetic modification. Bioremediation is interesting because there are plants out there that will actually sequester uh, heavy metals, that is they will actually uh, gather up heavy metals and take them out of the soil and there are other kinds of um, contam soil contaminants uh, that are actually removed and they can be, this can be aided by uh, genetic modification. There's even a plant out there that takes uh, explosive residues out of the soil. Uh, increased crop yield is important um, because, let's face it, um, the more crop, the more um, yield a farmer can get uh, per acre, the more money he's going to make and the more people you're going to be able to feed. And that leads us to the last uh, pro item that I have here enabling the feeding of the increased uh, world population. So that's a kind of a big issue, and it's somewhat uh, uh, debatable because on the, on the con side, people will say, well, you're never going to be able to get enough food to feed all the people uh, that uh, the Earth is uh, producing. We, we're now at a population of just over 7 billion. It's estimated that by 19, uh, I'm sorry, by 2050, the Earth's population will be uh, approximately 9 billion, and by the end of the century, we think it's going to start slowing down, it will still be up to about 10 billion. Now, most scientists agree that the carrying capacity of the Earth, that is the number of human beings that the Earth could actually sustain, is probably somewhere in the range of 9 to 10 billion. 
And I have to tell you that uh, right now the total acreage, uh, of our, the total amount of arable land on the face of the earth is 3.5, 3.5 billion acres. So uh, that is enough, depending on how you look at it, it might be enough to feed 10 billion people. But that would assume that people are eating a lot less meat, maybe no meat at all, and they're just eating a lot of uh, plants. Uh, if uh, people were vegetarians, uh, then you could feed, certainly feed that number of people, or at least the people were omnivores, and they, uh, they ate a little meat and a lot of vegetables. But if everybody is a carnivore, uh, then uh, we have to figure out that um, we're only going to be able to feed uh, about two and a half billion people. So um, obviously uh, there's large portions of the, of the uh, world right now where people don't eat meat or they get very, very little meat, which is why we're able to sustain the seven uh, billion people because most of the people in the United States are still only a small fraction of, you know, we're probably uh, maybe 5% of the Earth's population. So even though we probably consume more meat than anybody does, uh, we're not really adding so much to the problem. But we do have to be concerned uh, uh, with the fact that there are a lot of people and we have to be able to feed them. So let's look at some of the con items here. One uh, very important one is the loss of biodiversity. I can tell you that in the mid-19th century, when Ireland uh, experienced its potato famine, it was because of a pathogen that was introduced uh, there was, the, the, the Irish potato was essentially a monoculture. That was a, a form of potato that had no biodiversity in it at all. So what happened was all of the uh, potatoes basically came down with this blight and they, they were almost entirely lost. And only by bringing in potatoes from places like uh, South America and then uh, mating them with the few healthy potatoes that were still left were they able to actually save uh, the potato crop for uh, future years. Um, so the loss of biodiversity, uh, we have, we started out with, with lots of different varieties of all these different crops, and now we're going, uh, we're, we're heading towards monoculture again. We're heading towards having only a single or maybe a few uh, specific varieties. Now all the genetically modified things, it's not just one thing because you saw that you can add Bacillus thuringiensis, you can add something uh, to give you uh, protection against a particular uh, herbicide. You could add something that would enable the crop to grow in one climate uh, and then change it for another climate. So that's not real true biodiversity. So we are, we, we're in danger of actually losing that. Uh, another thing is the destruction of the non-GMO market. Well, if you don't care about whether a, a crop is genetically modified or not, uh, this is not an issue for you, but if you're somebody that only wants to eat non-GMO materials, materials that, are, that have not been genetically modified, then this is a real concern for you. If I'm a farmer and I'm raising corn and I'm telling everybody that buys my corn, I'm going to charge a little more money for it, I'm telling them that it is non-GMO corn. If the, if the farmer who's got the, uh, the, the, the lots, the, the, uh, the fields, next to my field is raising GMO corn within a very short period of time, probably one growing season, my non-GMO corn is no longer non-GMO corn. Because when the uh, insects, the, the bees, pollinate the corn from his field, and then they come over to my field, uh, they're going to take the, their, the genes from those genetically modified uh, corn plants and insert them into my non-genetically modified corn plants, and the following year, all of my corn, or even that year, all of my corn that's going to be cross-fertilized is now going to be GMO corn. So that is a concern. Uh, these, last, these next two issues, safety and allergenicity, I think are pretty much non-issues. A lot of the foaming at the mouth anti-GMO people who are really don't look at the science, uh, these people are uh, still up in arms about this. But if looking at the science, nobody's ever been able to demonstrate uh, that there are real, any, any real safety or allergenicity uh, concerns uh, regarding these things. And nevertheless, people still have the right to eat non-GMO materials if they want to do that. You know, I have, personally happen to think that I wouldn't spend any more money for something that was non-GMO because I don't worry about 
genetic modification. Uh, I think these things are sufficiently tested that they're really safe. Uh, but there is the issue of labeling. And this is a real uh, a hot, hotly debated topic. So the people that are on the con side are actually on the pro side of labeling, and the people that are on the pro side are on the con side of labeling. Because once you label something as uh, GMO, which is what this side wants, anything that is GMO, we want, to, we want to have it labeled as such because we want to be able to avoid it. This side says, wait a minute, if you put GMO onto a label, you're in fact telling people that there's something wrong with this. And we insist that there's nothing wrong with genetic modification. So why do you need to have a label? Well, in fact, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, which kind of controls all of this, they make no distinction between genetically modified and non-genetically modified um, food materials. So for, as far as the, the federal government is concerned right now, there is no distinction and there's not going to be labeling. But however, you know that people can get up in arms about things and then they start writing to their congressmen and uh, legislation might occur that's going to change this and we might see labeling at some point in the future. One does not know. Uh, the last thing here is uh, economic issues and uh, the, uh, the, the, the thing seems to be that a lot of people or people that are against this feel that uh, there's a little bit too much control in the hands of too few people. Too few companies, Monsanto in particular, uh, which has uh, most of the uh, patents for a lot of, for the genetically modified organisms and uh, produces a lot of these so-called Roundup Ready, uh, that's their trademark, Roundup Ready seeds. And the Roundup Ready seeds um, are basically distributed by a handful of companies, maybe a half a dozen other companies that license them from um, companies like uh, Archer Daniels Midland, uh, but the other uh, big agricultural giants uh, which actually license this technology uh, from Monsanto. And they probably have some uh, GMOs of their own as well. But anyway, um, the people that are against this are going to say, well, you know what, it's not, it's, who does this benefit? It benefits Monsanto and these other companies. It's not really benefiting everyone else. But on the pro side, uh, people will say, well, you know, there, yeah, yeah, there is an economic issue, but there's also this issue of being able to feed uh, the increased population of the world. And so uh, a lot of these other things that you can put into uh, the plants, uh, things like uh, improved nutrition, that actually does have an economic benefit uh, associated uh, with them. Uh, and it's not it's something that just benefits uh, the, the few, but it benefits the, uh, the many. So anyway, I want to thank everybody for your attention to this. Um, as I said, we'll have the 25-question test, and I'll see all of you uh, in a week.